All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to have some people that will be joining us a little bit later on. I first off want to start this webinar by personally just thanking you. I appreciate each and every one of you for joining me today. And most importantly, throughout this session and even afterwards, here is going to be my contact information. I absolutely love connecting with students one-on-one. -on -one. And if you have any questions, you want to talk about preparation, study tactics, strategy, you are more than welcome to email me, stay in touch with me throughout the journey. Today, what we're going to be doing is covering autonomic pharmacology. Now, this is a very high yield topic for your step one. And what we are going to do is we're going to take autonomics, we're going to go into the cellular, molecular, physiology, and then also take a big picture and talk about your human physiology and specifically BRS physiology concepts. What we will then do is kind of tie it into pathology. And like I'll highlight at the end of this session, autonomic pharmacology forms the basis for receptor physiology that you got to know, as well as forms the basis for understanding toxidromes as well. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction. If this is the first time you have attended this webinar, I definitely welcome you. And if you're returning, you've been to my past webinars or you have personally stayed in touch with me, I am so grateful to see you back here. A little bit about me, my name is Rahul and I'm currently a fifth year uh, pediatric critical care fellow in Atlanta, Georgia. And over the past five years, I've developed this amazing community known as Hi Guru. We focus on USMLE preparation, and in particular, I am passionate about taking content and focusing it on application. I am very, very passionate about making sure students are productive, and I like to motivate students as they go through their whole journey. It's a stressful exam, but recognize that if you come look at it from a community perspective, you are going to succeed so much. My three tenants in this project, learn, integrate, and apply. And so what I focus on that's a little bit different than other USMLA preparation companies is that I focus on active recall, I focus on integration, and I map all of this content to the USMLA content outline. I want to be very, very pertinent to the exam because I think that if you learn different strategies, if you learn the ways that test makers are going to ask questions, i.e. thinking like the test maker, you're going to be very successful in this exam. So like I said today, we're going to be covering autonomic uh, nervous system pharmacology. And in particular, guys, throughout this session, when you see a slide bold as well as a highlighted term, that's a pharmacological agent that you should definitely know. At the end of this webinar, I'm going to be going through just some top tactics on how to just study pharmacology for the step one. So definitely stay tuned for that. All right. The whole presentation today is going to be question based. Honestly, guys, we have about 50, 60 slides and each slide has a minimum of two questions. So just think about how many questions we're going to be covering today. Further, what I want you to do. This is very important. Open up your chat box. I have posted NBME questions throughout this review to act as a space repetition as we go through the slides. And I'm going to be going through question strategy through those questions. But then also, I am going to encourage you to put your answer in the chat box so we can interact. I'll be having a tab of questions. So at the end of the session, we'll go ahead and uh, answer any questions you may have as well. Um, real quick. If you can hear me, if you're ready to go, go ahead and say yes, woohoo, hey, hey, anything in the chat box so I know you all are active and engaged and uh, ready for this session. Are you guys ready? Awesome. Great. Perfect. This is awesome. Look at how many people are here. All right. I got a hey, hey. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. This is a warm up question, so keep your chat box ready. I'll give you about 30 seconds to read and answer this question. And after the time is up, go ahead and put your answer in the chat box. 
I'll see you in 30. All right, couple more seconds here. Go ahead and type your answer in the chat. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and review the answer. The answer here is going to be C. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we're going through autonomics today, what we are going to really focus on is parasympathetic and sympathetic. And what we have to understand in terms of the ganglia are that in between the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, the ganglia are going to be either short or far away. When you're talking about preganglionic sympathetic fibers, preganglionic sympathetic fibers are going to be short, whereas the postganglionic sympathetic fibers are going to be very long. The parasympathetic system is actually going to be the exact opposite. Preganglionic parasympathetic fibers, those are actually going to be long, whereas the postganglionic parasympathetic, they are what we call embedded within the effector organ. And so they are going to be short. Correct answer here is going to be C. This is going to be our overview slide. And what we understand here is that the autonomic nervous system is going to have parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. Now, I just don't like to put up tables and say, yo, memorize them. I want to actually let you know what is testable from this image. What is very testable are the following. This point right here, that in between the ganglion synapses, what I call the interganglion synapse, you have an acetylcholine receptor, and that's a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Remember that nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, very high yield, are going to be ion channels, whereas muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, those are going to be G protein couple receptors. Now I'm going to highlight some other things for us to understand. And that is that at the adrenal medulla, you also have a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. What you should understand here is that at the adrenal medulla, it's just like an interganglion synapse nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, very high yield for us to know. The other exception that they love for us to understand here is that sweat glands, sweat glands are actually going to be muscarinic in actual organization, but they are going to be under sympathetic control. As you can see, the sweat glands are under sympathetic control, but they have a muscarinic receptor. The big picture here, guys, is that when you're talking about the parasympathetic nervous system, you're thinking about muscarinic receptors, whereas when you're thinking about the sympathetic division, you are going to be thinking about alpha and beta as well as dopaminergic receptors. All right. So contrast all of this autonomic stuff. Remember, automatic, autonomous, autonomic you are going to actually contrast that with the somatic nervous system. And the somatic nervous system is what we see at our neuromuscular junction. That is a talk for later on. We will highlight that when we talk about things like vecuronium, rocuronium, succinylcholine. All right, right off the bat, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a high yield organization that I actually put on my one page sheet, you know, the one page sheet that you get as, as soon as you're going into the uh, USMLE exam, I actually put all of these receptors on my one page seat sheet so that it would be easy for us to reference. Now, the mnemonic that first aid even highlights is going to be kiss and kick until you're sick of super kinky sex. And this helps us remember the various types of receptors in the autonomic nervous system, and in particular, what G protein class they are going to be related to. Now, what's important for us to understand before we go into the G protein class, guys, is we need to understand the location of these receptors. Very high yield. Let me say that again. The location of the receptors is extremely important for us to understand. So when we think about alpha receptors. Alpha receptors are going to be in our smooth muscle of the vessels and specifically in the skin. And I like to say in the aorta. And it's going to also be in your eye and specifically your dilator muscle in the eye. 
Now, going along with the mnemonic, alpha one is going to be GQ. Alpha two is going to be GI related. And what's important for us to understand here, guys, is that alpha two is going to inhibit sympathetic outflow. So if you have alpha two agonism, you're gonna have less epinephrine and norepinephrine coming out of the synapse. Beta one is going to be found in the heart and consistent with the mnemonic, it's going to be GS related. Beta two is going to be found in many areas. Specifically, you're gonna be thinking about the lungs and the bronchi. You're going to be thinking about the vascular smooth muscle, but more in the muscle area. Just think about it. This is sympathetic, fight or flight. If you're running from the bear, where do you want all of your blood to go? Well, you wanna to go to your arms, your legs, your buttocks, because you're running away. And so vascular smooth muscle dilation is going to be key for beta two, whereas vascular smooth muscle constriction is going to be important for you to understand for alpha one. They test this all the time. Very important for us to know. In beta two, you're also going to be thinking about the ciliary body making aqueous humor. That's why I put the eye there, as well as in the uterus, you are going to be seeing a beta two receptor. And that's where we use medications like terbutaline, which we'll talk about as a beta modulator when we're talking about tocolysis. Beta three found in the skeletal muscle, not too high yield for you to know, but alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, you got to know those. And that's related to KISS. Now let's go ahead and move on to the parasympathetic structures. Now parasympathetic just has a little bit of a review. Remember parasympathetic, they're muscarinic receptors and muscarinic is G protein coupled receptors. Whereas acetylcholine receptors that are nicotinic, those are going to be ion channels. Now, what's high yield is the M1, M2, M3. M1 is going to stimulate the enteric nervous system. M2 is going to be found in the heart, and it is going to be GI related. That's why acetylcholine that actually hits the heart is going to cause bradycardia. And what's the specific receptor? Yeah, you got it. It's going to be M2. Very high yield for us to understand. Now, how do I remember this? Well, most of you are going to be M2s right now taking this very stressful exam. And what happens? You get all of these heart changes, i.e. you get palpitations because you're so nervous. When you're an M2, you're going to be nervous. Think about M2 receptors being at the heart. M2, GI, got to remember that. Very, very important for you to know. M3 is going to be found in the lungs. Remember, beta 2 was also found in the lungs. It's going to be causing you to leak, leak, leak from your GI tract, so causing diarrhea, from your urinary tract, so causing urination. And remember, M3, if you have agonism or if acetylcholine binds to the M3 receptor, just think to yourself, are you going to get constriction or dilation of your pupils? And the answer is, you are going to get constriction. Remember, parasympathetic, you are going to get bronchoconstriction and meiosis of the pupil. Sympathetic, you're going to get medriasis. So kick is the mnemonic here. Finally, we're going to be moving on to our next portion of the mnemonic, and that is sick. Now, as you can see, it goes into the H1. So if you're lining this up, alphas, betas, M, then dopamine, histamine, and you're going to have the vasopressin. Now, when you're thinking about D1 and D2, D1 is going to actually be found in the kidneys, whereas D2 is going to be found in the brain. Remember, dopamine antagonists, extremely high yield for your step one, dopamine antagonists are the antipsychotics. You'll see that in psych pharmacology. H1 and H2, remember that H1 is that tail end portion of sick, and H1 is going to be found in the nose. What you also have to understand is that H2 is going to be found in the gut. So remember, H1, diphenhydramine, cetirizine, those are going to help in allergies, whereas things such as ranitidine are going to help be a gut protectant. V1 and V2 are going to be your next portions here. In the case of V1, that is going to be found in your vessels. And similar to alpha-1, it is going to be GQ-mediated. And 
it is going to cause vasoconstriction of the vessels. So guys, this is high yield. Alpha-1 and V-1, they're both GQ, and they are going to actually constrict vessels. V-2 is going to be found in your collecting duct of the nephron. And what's high yield for us to know is that V2 is going to respond to ADH. ADH released from the supraoptic nuclei of the hypothalamus and subsequently goes via the posterior pituitary and hits the V2 receptor, which is GS mediated. These are going to be the questions related to diabetes insipidus, as well as the questions related to SIADH. High yield V2 mediates aquaporin insertion into the distal collecting duct. All right, kiss and kick until you're sick of super kinky sex. This was one of the harder concepts, guys, and that's why I put it in the beginning. The rest is gonna be downhill. Let's go ahead and start with an NBME question. All right, so the three steps that I use as I go through an NBME question is stem, paraphrase, and predict. Stem, we look at the last line of the question. Paraphrase, we go line by line and interpret the question. And then we predict what we think the answer is. Let's go ahead and start. Which of the following is a body site where auto uh, autonomic receptors are primarily alpha-1 adrenergic? So here we have a 55-year-old woman suffering from postural hypotension. She's treated with an alpha-1 adrenergic drug. Basically, this question is asking us, where do autonomic alpha-1 receptors, where are they located? Do you guys know? All right, we have some answers here. Go ahead and type into the chat. What do you guys think the answer is here? Okay, I got one person that is saying E. That is great. Okay. Excellent. And in this scenario, the answer is going to be E. Now remember that the alpha receptor is going to be where? It's actually going to be in the dilator muscle of the iris. And that's high yield for us to recognize that it's going to be in the dilator muscle of the iris. Alpha one is going to be vasoconstricting at the level of the skin. That's why when you are fight or flight, you get cool, cold, and clammy because you are going to have alpha-1 vasoconstriction. All right, guys, let's go ahead and now talk about the parasympathetic division. The parasympathetic division, we're going to start with the direct cholinergic agonist. So the first question we'll ask is, what are the side effects of these agents? Well, if they're cholinomimetic, they are going to cause you to be leaky, leaky, leaky. We classically think about dumbbells, but I like to just say leaky, leaky, leaky. But understand that along with the diarrhea and all of the leakiness, you're going to get meiosis, which is important, which is pupillary constriction, and you're going to get bradycardia. Another thing that is parasympathetically derived, guys, is going to be accommodation, the contraction of the ciliary body and the ciliary muscle, and the fact that you can look close up. Remember that these agents are going to have coal in them. So things like bethanicol, carbacol, methacholine. Which agent was actually historically used to diagnose asthma? And that was actually methacholine. Methacholine challenge was the historical way to diagnose asthma. Now we actually look at an increase in FEV1 after we give a beta-2 agonist such as albuterol. Let's go ahead and answer this question. A patient with history of Sjogren syndrome presents with a sudden loss of vision. The patient has elevated intraocular pressure and is found to have open angle glaucoma. So open angle glaucoma, remember the actual canal of Schlem is plugged up. The patient is given pilocarpine as a treatment and pilocarpine is a direct cholinergic agonist. What is the mechanism as to how this helps? Well, this agent is going to contract the ciliary muscle of the eye. And if we look at it visually, if you contract the ciliary muscle of the eye, 
you are going to pull it downwards, just like this. It gets pulled downwards and then it opens the canal of Schlem. Remember that when you're talking about open angle glaucoma, think of open angle glaucoma as a blockage of the canal of Schlem. And as a result, the angle between the cornea and the iris is actually going to expand. And that is extremely important for you to know. Because the problem with the other pathology that you need to know for step one, which is going to be closed angle glaucoma, closed angle glaucoma happens here, in which the iris and the lens are sandwiched together. And thus, you are going to get closing of the angle as the aqueous humor cannot drain from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber, all right? What we'll now talk about are going to be the indirect cholinergic agonists. Now, indirect cholinergic agonists, let's go through this. Here you have an 80-year-old male who presents with progressive confusion and decreased ability to perform activities of daily living. He has prescribed a medication which helps his underlying condition. What is the likely mechanism of action of this agent? So somebody with progressive confusion, somebody who can't perform their activities of daily living, you're going to be thinking of Alzheimer's disease. And in particular with Alzheimer's disease, you want to increase levels of acetylcholine. One of the ways that we do that is actually inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, which is acetylcholinesterase. So what we'll talk about are the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Plot twist, what you got to know, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, you got to know that acetylcholine nesterase inhibitors are going to end in stigmine. Very high yield for you to know. The other agents are going to be things like denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. Think about it. When you're done with Alzheimer's, you're going to have revelry, rivastigmine, and you're going to be gallivanting around, dancing around, denepazil, galantamine, rivastigmine. Let's go ahead and talk about this question. A patient presents with progressive muscle weakness and diplopia. He is found to have anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. So an autoimmune attack to the acetylcholine receptor. What is the likely agent which can be used as a treatment for this patient? Anytime I see progressive muscle weakness, as well as bulbar symptoms like diplopia, I'm going to be thinking about the pathology, myasthenia gravis. And for myasthenia gravis, we use peridostigmine. Guess what, guys? Peridostigmine gets rid of myasthenia gravis or gravis myasthenia. Peridostigmine is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It increases the amount of acetylcholine that is going to be in the synapse, and thus it helps with your muscle weakness. You can use things like edrophonium. This was historically to see whether or not patient is going to uh, actually have improvement of their muscle weakness, but now we just do antibody testing. And remember that the suffix stigmine helps you recognize acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Moving on, a child presents with profuse vomiting and diarrhea. So he's leaky, leaky, leaky. He is tachypnic, sweating, and has constricted pupils, meiosis. Upon history, you note he was playing in the back of the garage at the babysitter's house when these symptoms came upon. What do you think is the likely diagnosis? All right. So in this scenario, you see leaky, 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 you see meiosis, and you're going to see something in the test question that the child was playing somewhere at the back of the garage, et cetera. This is going to be classic for organophosphate poisoning. And in organophosphate poisoning, think about your acetylcholinesterase being pathologically inhibited. The treatment for, a C, for your organophosphate poisoning is going to be atropine. Because when you have a high amount of acetylcholine in the synapse, not only are you going to be leaky, but what you're going to have to understand is that you have to inhibit 
that acetylcholine. And when you inhibit that acetylcholine or when you need to do that, you are going to use atropine, which is a muscarinic antagonist. Understand that with organophosphate poisoning, another treatment is going to be 2-PAN. So just think about it in this way. Here you are going to have your acetylcholine receptor. And as we know, the acetylcholinesterase is going to be blocked by malthion and parathion, which are going to be actually what are found in the insecticides that inhibit acetylcholinesterase. As a result, you have a high amount of acetylcholine in the synapse, and that's why in the vignette, the child was very leaky. What you have to give is you have to give atropine in order to inhibit the downstream effects of the high acetylcholine, but you also have to kick off the malthion and parathion so that you take all of this acetylcholine and break it down into inactive acetylcholine. And the only way you do that is you give 2-PAM, which regenerates your acetylcholinesterase. Here's going to be a multiple choice question. Let's go ahead and use our tactic, stem, paraphrase, and predict. Which of the following drugs would antagonize most of the symptoms exhibited by this patient? So for our patient, the EMS comes and administers atropine. Woohoo! Now, this same child, after getting atropine, has mental confusion, restlessness, incoherence, hallucinatory behavior. The patient is going to have dilated pupils, is going to be dry, hot in terms of skin temperature, and is going to have distended abdomen with no bowel sounds. Take a look at his vital signs. What do you think would antagonize most of these symptoms that the patient has? Go ahead and type that in the chat. What do you think is the answer here when we're talking about this vignette? Somebody who's super dry, no bowel sounds, tachycardic. All right, we're getting a lot of participation. I encourage everyone to blow up the chat box with their answer. All right, and the answer here is going to be physostigmine. Remember, physostigmine fixes atropine overdose. Physostigmine fixes atropine overdose. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you have to now understand is that parasympathetic High parasympathetic states, such as your organophosphate poisoning, makes you leaky, 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 bradycardic, and meiotic. Whereas atropine overdose, you are going to be very dry, 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 tachycardic, and have midriasis. This session is not passive. This session is active. So I encourage you, go ahead and participate in the chat box. And I would love for you to answer, ask questions. And at the end of the session, I'll definitely get through um, all of your questions. All right, here's another question that we're gonna go through. Which of the following molecular mechanisms most likely mediated the therapeutic effect of the drug in the patient's disease? All right, tough question here. Paraphrase is gonna be our next step. A 74 year old man complains of memory impairment that has worsened over the past two months. So in this sentence, you're probably thinking about a dementia. He also reports that he had increased difficulty recognizing familiar objects and in planning everyday activities such as shopping. So activities of daily living are low. So you're thinking about a dementia, maybe Alzheimer's. Physical exam shows no neurological deficits and the patient performed very poorly on the mini mental status exam. The patient is giving donepazil. What do you think donepazil is going to do? All right, so a little bit of a review question. Go ahead and type into the chat. What do you think donepazil is going to do?
Awesome. We're getting a lot of great responses and you're absolutely correct that inhibition of cholinesterase is going to be the correct answer. Denepazil, ribostigmine, galantamine. This is how you're learning pharmacology, step by step. So when we're thinking about the parasympathetic antagonists, such as atropine, for example, you are going to be thinking of dry and that classic mnemonic, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, etc. The other things for us to understand is that anticholinergic effects are going to cause the high yield things right here, sedation. So that's why when I'm giving, um, when, when people are going through the uh, USMLE, at times people are taking things like Benadryl. What, what is Benadryl? Well, Benadryl, which is diphenhydramine, is a second generation H1 blocker, but it also has anticholinergic effects and thus it can cause sedation. It can be used as a sleep aid. The other thing that you have to understand is that if you give a medication like atropine, which is a cholinergic antagonist, you can actually end up getting midriasis and that can worsen your closed angle glaucoma. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Remember that the effects of atropine are going to be that it increases heart rate. And that is so high yield for you to know that when patients are going to be super bradycardic, you can give atropine because it's a cholinergic antagonist. Cholinergic antagonist means anti-parasympathetic, which means you increase your heart rate. So in this slide, I want to kind of talk to you about how atropine is going to be contraindicated or may worsen narrow angle glaucoma. Now let's go through the pathophysiology of narrow angle glaucoma first. Remember narrow angle glaucoma, you're gonna have the iris and the lens, they are sandwiched on top of each other. So as the, the ciliary body makes aqueous humor, the aqueous humor can't go from posterior chamber to anterior chamber, it gets stuck. And so what angle closes in narrow angle glaucoma? The angle between the cornea and the iris, that angle ends up closing. Now, when you are going to actually relax the ciliary muscle, think about the iris and lens actually being sandwiched together even more because you just relax everything. So the iris and the lens are sandwiched together even more, and that's why it can worsen the narrow angle or predispose you to acute closed angle glaucoma. How does acute closed angle glaucoma present on your exam? A painful red eye, kind of a cloudy cornea, that is going to be the key presentation with blurry vision of acute closed angle glaucoma. All right, here's another integrative concept. And what I would encourage you is to follow along with me with the slide. And I promise you, I'm gonna send you this slide at the end of the session, because I think it's important for you to um, uh, integrate this slide into your study. Remember that I said, that many medications like Benadryl, for example, have anticholinergic properties. And what's important for us to understand, just from a step one pharmacology standpoint, anytime the USMLE gives a pharmacological agent whose side effect is going to be used for something else, you gotta know that agent. So for example, diphenhydramine, yes, it's a histamine blocker, but guess what? Diphenhydramine, is going to have anticholinergic properties. So it is going to be used as a sleep aid and it can be used as an anti-emetic. Amitriptyline or imipramine can be used for nocturnal enuresis. Yes, they're TCAs, but they actually are going to cause you to dry up your bladder secretions. Things such as benstropine have anticholinergic properties that can really help you when a patient has acute dystonia. So the question that they'll say is that, oh, you have a patient who has just started on an antipsychotic. And when they were started on an antipsychotic, remember, majority of those have a D2 antagonism, they end up getting their neck twitched like this. And in that scenario, you're going to be thinking about torticollis, and you need to use benstropine as your reversal agent. Things such as atropine, those are going to be your quintessential anticholinergics as well. So I hope that this table helps you recognize that there are some agents that we use for one property, but they have a side effect like anticholinergic properties that we use for another disease. 
All right, here's another NBMing question. I think this is a great time for me to give you 30 seconds. Do the stem paraphrase and predict, and I will see you in about 30 to 45 seconds. Go for it and read it. All right. What do we think is the correct answer here? We have a lot of great answers and the correct answer here is going to be D, increased AV conduction. Now remember that patients who are going to be bradycardic are going to have increased AV nodal delay or what we need to understand is they're going to have low or they're going to have increased amounts of time to go from SA AV and then down to the bundle of Hiss. And because it is affecting the electrical activity of the heart, you are going to need to act very quickly. And that's when you're going to give atropine whenever you have this bradycardia. Okay. High yield for you to understand that bradycardia on your exam could also be worded as increased AV nodal delay or increased AV nodal conduction. All right. Going into our next set of questions. A patient presents with cerebral palsy, and this patient has increased amounts of secretions coming out of the mouth. What is the likely agent which may be prescribed? So we're thinking about your cholinergic antagonist, and in this scenario, you are going to be thinking of glycopyrrolate. Glycopyrrolate helps you actually decrease the amount of secretions because it's a cholinergic antagonist. Now, what are the other medications in this class that are used to treat things like overactive bladder and spasms? Well, that's going to be things such as tolteridine, solefacin, oxybutynin. So tolteridine, solefacin, and oxybutynin, these are going to be agents which are going to treat a very spasmy or twitchy, twitchy bladder. What's high yield for us to understand is that oxybutynin is for overactive bladder. Oxybutynin is for overactive bladder. This is going to be a vignette on your step one in which somebody is going to constantly be leaking and they are not going to have any effect with changes in intra-abdominal pressure. Remember that when you're talking about stress incontinence, Stress incontinence is going to be the patient is laughing or exercising and whoops, they become incontinent. Whereas overactive bladder, it is essentially a small bladder. As soon as pee hits the bladder, boom, it's going to contract. So things like oxybutynin help you treat overactive bladder. How about this one? A patient presents with emesis every time he goes on a cruise. What is the likely agent that may be prescribed? So in this scenario, you are going to be thinking of something like motion sickness. And in motion sickness, you can put a scopolamine patch. So scopolamine patches are used for motion sickness, anticholinergic effects, and they are anti-nausea as well. All right. A patient presents with wheezing. He is a smoker for many years and has been diagnosed with COPD. His lab medication is going to be combined with what agent to help with secretions from his bronchitis? So in COPD, LABAs are going to be combined with agents such as teotropium and iprotropium. And all those tropium medicines, you can think of tropium as another high yield suffix because tropium are going to be cholinergic antagonists. They're going to dry you up. How about this one? A patient presents for ophthalmological exam. Tro topical, not tropical, whoa. Topical tropicamide is placed on the eye surface. What is the net effect of this agent? So think to yourself, I put an anticholinergic medicine on my eye, like tropicamide. What is going to happen to my eye? It's going to dilate. And that's important is that the eye dilates when you put an anticholinergic. You can think of it as when you see Tropicana orange juice, your eyes, whoa, widen up. Tropicamide is going to be an anticholinergic agent. All right. 
We talked a lot about muscarinic agents, both agonists and the antagonists. And now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the nicotinic antagonist. The nicotinic antagonist block the neuromuscular junction. And you have two broad categories, non-depolarizing antagonists, which end in curanium, and depolarizing antagonists, which are things like succinylcholine. Non-depolarizing antagonists are going to be competitive antagonists. And these competitive antagonists, remember, bind to that same site of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And thus, in your test questions, you need to know they are going to push, v, they're going to push KM to the right. Understand that these agents can cause histamine release and they end in curonium, things like vecuronium, rocuronium, cisatrocurium. What you also have to understand is that if you are going to use these medications, you can use neostigmine, which is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor which increases acetylcholine at the synapse, and thus you can use it for reversal. Big picture, why do we use these agents? We use them for paralysis. We use them for paralysis. So if you are going to get a procedure done in the operating room, or if you're going to be intubated, have a breathing tube stuck down, you're going to need to use agents which block the neuromuscular junction. And so how do you revive the neuromuscular junction? Well, you use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. All right. Depolarizing antagonists, I said, those are things like succinylcholine. What succinylcholine does is it has choline in it. So it acts just like acetylcholine. And what it'll do is it will bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction, and it will cause sustained depolarization. And if you have sustained depolarization you're going to be paralyzed. There are a couple phases which are important conceptually to know. In phase one, you have prolonged depolarization. So if you give cholinesterase inhibitors like pyridostigmine, for example, you may actually have even more persistent depolarization, more persistent paralysis. Phase two, you're partially repolarized. But what happens here is that you can actually then use cholinesterase inhibitors to kind of revive your neuromuscular junction. High yield for us to understand that succinylcholine is part of this class. So depolarizing antagonists, that's succinylcholine. Non-depolarizing antagonists, those are your curoniums. High yield, this affects the neuromuscular junction, the nicotinic ion channel receptors. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the next portion of this, we are going to be talking about the sympathetic division. And the sympathetic division is going to be formed of similar kind of uh, agents, sympathomimetics and sympatholytics. Let's go ahead and start this question. A child presents after being on the playground with shortness of breath, wheezing, and abdominal cramping. He is tachypnic. What is the medication which emergently needs to be administered at this time? So here you have a patient who was just on the playground and he has signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. So I am epi is going to be your agent of choice. Remember that patients who are going to be in anaphylaxis are going to need epinephrine. Epinephrine is also the correct answer in somebody who is essentially dead and you're trying to do CPR to try to revive them. So pulseless VTAC or VFib, you're going to be using. Anybody that's pulseless, you're gonna use epinephrine to jumpstart that heart. Let's go ahead and do this NBME question. Which of the following post-receptor mechanisms most likely affected, uh, mediated the effect of epinephrine on cardiac contractility? A 75-year-old woman has been hospitalized for breast cancer, and she was found unconscious. A diagnosis of cardiac arrest was made. CPR was started without success. The EKG shows that the patient was asystolic, and I cardiac epinephrine was given. What does epinephrine do at the post-receptor 
agent or as a post receptor agent. And that is going to be E, you got it, activation of adenylate cyclase. Remember that epinephrine is going to hit the beta-1 receptor. And beta-1 is found in the heart. And beta-1, if we go back to our KISS mnemonic, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. And that's GS, adenylate cyclase mediated. So remember that epinephrine is going to increase our heart rate via beta-1. And at higher doses, epinephrine actually also hits the alpha receptor. And that's so high yield that epinephrine is going to first hit beta and then march on up and then tickle the alpha receptor. And that's why you get an increase in systolic blood pressure. Now, in terms of diastolic blood pressure, at low doses, epinephrine is going to cause you to decrease your diastolic blood pressure. Because think about it, your diastolic blood pressure is mediated by a beta-2. And what does beta-2 do? Beta-2 vasodilates. High yield for us to understand here. The next portion here is understanding that if we have high-dose epinephrine, high-dose epinephrine hits the alpha-1 receptor, and thus you get both systolic and diastolic hypertension. All right, this is going to be a tough question. Let's go ahead and do this together. So which of the following drug doses does the new agent most resemble? All right, we're talking about this new agent. Now, let me give you a strategy point here, guys. For the USMLE, anytime I see a graph or a table, I use three steps. I first tell myself, don't panic. The second step, as I say, is define the table headings. And the third step that I say, is going to be look for trends. Don't panic, define the headings, look for trends. So you see different parameters on one side of the table, you see control peak drug effect, and let's go through the trend. Well, as you can see here, the drug gives you some hypertension, both an asystolic and diastolic, but the actual drug causes you to have bradycardia, and the drug is going to slightly decrease your cardiac output. So what is this agent? Something that increases blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. I'm going to think that this agent is more alpha-1 mediated. And if this agent is alpha-1 mediated, it is going to cause a reflex bradycardia. And that's why we see, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we see a decrease in heart rate. And this helps us introduce norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is the opposite of epinephrine. Norepinephrine is alpha-1, much, much, much greater than beta. I think of norepinephrine, no beta. Norepinephrine is primarily alpha. And so when we're talking about that reflex bradycardia, we are thinking about the carotid sinus baroreceptor reflex. And the carotid sinus baroreceptor reflex is going to essentially sense increased stretch. In this case, the baroreceptors actually increased the, or the blood pressure helped you actually activate the baroreceptor reflex. Afferent signal being via cranial nerve number nine, and the efferent signal being via the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve then causes you to have acetylcholine that is going to hit right on that SA node. And thus, you get reflex bradycardia when you have a actual increase in blood pressure. And this is all mediated via the baroreceptor reflex. The other question that you get about the baroreceptor reflex, guys, is going to be a patient who has supraventricular tachycardia. Now, in supraventricular tachycardia, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to need to do carotid massage. Why? Because the heart rate is going to be fast, fast, fast. They're going to give you an EKG that shows a narrow complex tachycardia. And they'll say, what's the next best step? Well, you got to do carotid massage that activates the baroreceptor reflex because there's increased stretch. And remember, the efferent signal is going to be acetylcholine hitting the SA node. And thus, you are going to get a decrease in heart rate. You're going to slow down the heart rate in SVC.
in, in SVT. Very important for us to understand. All right. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about your norepinephrine. So a child presents with fever and hypotension. He goes to the PICU and is found to have an elevated lactate. Ooh, that's not good. Patient on exam is warm to the touch. A blood culture is drawn and it grows MRSA. So anytime you think about fever, hypotension, and a positive blood culture, guys, you got to think about septic shock. Important for you to know. He has started on vancomycin, and an adrenergic agent is also started because his blood pressure continues to go down. So in septic shock, blood pressure going down, you are going to be thinking about giving an alpha agonist like norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is going to be a presser that we use to increase the blood pressure. And how does it work? Well, it's going to increase alpha-1 activity. And what is alpha-1? Well, alpha-1, kind of like my shirt, nice and stylish, GQ. All right, let's keep going. A patient presents with runny nose and chronic cough. He has prescribed an agent which helps him control his rhinorrhea. So he has a lot of inflammation up there. What do you give for this? Well, you give another alpha agent. And guys, you give a agent like phenylephrine. Phenylephrine, you spray up in the nose and it whoop, constricts the vessels of the nose and thus it can help in somebody who is going to have rhinorrhea. Other medications, which are alpha-1 agonists, remember, they're going to increase your blood pressure as well, alpha-1 agonists, things like metolazine, mitodrine. So mitodrine is used in things like postural hypotension. When somebody is just always so woozy, they give mitodrine to kind of increase the vascular tone. An elderly male presents with urinary frequency and feeling of his bladder not emptying. Whoa, elderly male with this kind of sentence? You're going to be thinking about BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. What is the likely mechanism of the agent which can help his urinary symptoms? You're going to be thinking about your alpha-1 antagonists. Those end in the suffix osin, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, tamulosin. Tamulosin can also be used in patients who have hypertension as well as BPH. And prazosin helps with PTSD. These agents being alpha-1 antagonists can cause hypotension and thus cause a reflex tachycardia. So now we talked about hypertension being associated with reflex bradycardia, whereas hypotension being associated with reflex tachycardia. A patient presents with intermittent flushing, pallor, and hypertension. Lab studies show increased HVA and VMA. So when you're thinking about somebody who has intermittent bouts of sympathetic state and high epinephrine and norepinephrine breakdown products, you're going to be thinking of what tumor? Pheochromocytoma. And in pheochromocytoma, you want to give things like phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine. Now, phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine, the difference between them is that phentolamine is a non-selective alpha blocker, whereas phenoxybenzamine is going to be a long duration, non-selective and non-reversible alpha blocker. So when you have a pheochromocytoma, you need to give non-specific alpha blockade. That's really important that you need to give this non-specific alpha blockade. All right. I think this is a great time for us to do another interactive question. I'm going to give you 30 seconds on the clock, guys. We are almost done with this session. 30 seconds on the clock. Go ahead and read it. I'll see you in 30. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what do we think is going on here? Well, this patient probably was given phenylephrine. And remember that phenylephrine is actually going to be a alpha-1 agonist. So yes, it's going to be helping you with nasal decongestion. But remember, alpha-1 agonist at the level of your urethral sphincter is going to plug you up. So alpha-1 agonist phenylephrine, high yield for you to know. All right. 
A patient presents with hypertension in pregnancy. She is prescribed a medication, and days later, she has malar rash, joint pain, low-grade fever, and she's found to have antihistone antibody positive. So a drug, and then she has these lupus-like symptoms. This is drug-induced lupus presentation. The likely medication that caused this is probably going to be alpha-methyldopa because alpha-methyldopa is used in pregnancy and it is an alpha-2 agonist. So what do alpha-2 agonists do? Alpha-2 agonists decrease sympathetic outflow and thus they are going to cause you to lower your blood pressure. Other medicines that we use in this class, alpha-2 agonists, remember GI, G-protein couple receptor I, clonidine, guanfacine, dexmedetomidine. We use clonidine for patients who are going to need some sedation or patients who are going to have high blood pressure. The side effects is that they can cause you to have sedation, hypotension, and bradycardia. Why? Alpha-2 agonists reduce sympathetic outflow. So if there's no sympathetic outflow, you're going to have hypotension and bradycardia. How about this question? A patient in a nursing home is depressed and is losing weight. An agent which increases appetite and also increases mood is prescribed. So something that causes you to affect both depression and increasing mood, you're going to be thinking of mirtazapine. Mirtazapine is going to be also known as Remeron. It's an antidepressant, but it's an alpha-2 antagonist. It thus is going to cause you to perk up a little bit because it antagonizes alpha-2, and it is going to cause you to have a better appetite. All right, guys. So this is just an integrative concept. Important for us to understand here is that hypertension in pregnancy, you're going to use agents that have the mnemonic hypertensive moms love nifedipine. So hydralazine, methyl dopa, which is an alpha-2 agonist. We just talked about that. Labetalol and nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. Okay. All right. Great. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about sympathomimetic. We are almost done. And we're going to talk about beta receptors now. So how is the medication dobutamine different from isoproteranol. So when we're thinking about dobutamine, dobutamine is going to be beta one. You can just put a one near the B in dobutamine. The thing for us to understand is that it is used as an ionotrope and a chronotrope in heart failure. Isoproteranol is both a beta one and a beta two agonist. And the way that I like to talk about isoproteranol, I say it protects both beta-1 and beta-2. It hits both beta-1 and beta-2. What you have to understand is that beta receptors are increasingly, increasingly important in patients who are going to have things like wheezing, shortness of breath, a history of eczema, and need something that bronchodilates. This is going to be an agent like albuterol. And remember that the side effect of albuterol is going to be tremor, anxiety, and arrhythmia. Why? Because it causes you to have a pro-sympathomimetic effect. Why does it cause you to have tachycardia? Because sometimes the beta-2 from albuterol can hit the beta-1, and thus you can have a, that permissive effect, and that can cause you to have the tremulousness as well as especially the tachycardia. The long-acting beta-2 agonists those are going to be salmeterol and formeterol. So albuterol is short acting, whereas the long acting is salmeterol and formeterol. Let's go ahead and talk about the other end, and that is sympatholytic. A patient presents with tachycardia and signs and symptoms of angina. The patient has a history of asthma and a beta blocker is prescribed. What would be the names of the agents prescribed? So if you have asthma, COPD, any obstructive lung disease, and they're talking to you a little bit about what specific beta blocker you need to give, you need to give a beta-1 specific. Because again, beta-2 or nonspecific beta blockade is going to cause you to have bronchoconstriction. 
So bismolol, esmolol, atenolol, metoprolol, those are going to be olols, and those are going to be specific to beta-1. There are also non-selective beta and alpha antagonists. And a non-selective beta and alpha antagonist are going to be things like carvedilol and labetalol. Remember, labetalol was in the hypertensive moms love nifedipine, L for labetalol. Carvedilol, I like to say it carves a little bit out of beta, it carves a little bit out of alpha. Carvedilol, that's how you remember it. A patient with alcoholism presents with painful vomiting and bleeding. He is scoped and found to have bleeding esophageal varices. What is the likely agent which can be used to decrease splanchnic pressures and help with his varices? So with esophageal varices, you want to decrease that vascular pressure. And so you are going to be giving agents like propranolol. It's a non-selective beta blocker that is going to decrease the pressure that is on that varices. Remember, alcoholism, you're going to think about things like esophageal varices, periumbilical varices, and even rectal varices. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and do another integrative concept and talking about the side effects of beta blockade. Remember that beta blockades, they're advantageous because they are going to decrease oxygen consumption of the heart. What they also do is they decrease renin release. And what we understand is that beta-2 blockade has a little bit different effects. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to talk about beta-2 blockade. Beta-2 blockade causes you to have bronchoconstriction. Beta-2 blocker is going to cause bronchoconstriction. In the liver, it causes decreased gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Beta blockers, thus, are going to mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia in diabetics. Because when you block beta, you're not going to be able to break down that glycogen, and thus you can actually have a hypoglycemic event. In terms of serum potassium, I want to take a step back and just tell you that beta agonism pushes potassium into cells. So if you have a beta antagonism, you won't be able to push potassium into cells and thus you'll become hyperkalemic. And that's important for us, us to also recognize. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be our last question of the day. Before our summary, let's go ahead. I'll give you about 30 seconds. You all should be answering here. Go ahead, stem, paraphrase, and predict. You got this. I'll see you in 30 seconds. All right. So let's analyze this question. This patient has hyperkalemia and kidney failure. And what do we do for hyperkalemia? Well, related to autonomics, we actually give albuterol. Because remember, albuterol is a beta-2 agonist that pushes potassium into cells. Very important. It's a beta-2 agonist that pushes potassium into cells. And thus, we use it as one of the adjuncts in patients who have hyperkalemia. And remember, hyperkalemia, watch for those peak T waves on your EKG. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the summary of our session. What did we do today? So we talked a little bit about parasympathetic and sympathetic. We talked about the difference between mimetics and antagonists. And you can now have a little bit of appreciation, right? If you have a cholinomimetic, you are going to be leaky, leaky, leaky. But if you're going to be anti-sympathetic, you may also have similar pro-parasympathetic effects. On the opposite end, if you have anticholinergic, you're going to be dry, dry, dry. But if you also have sympathomimetic effects, you're going to be dry as well. So now what you're going to have to kind of understand is that autonomic pharmacology is going to form the basis for toxicology. It's going to form the basis for some of your cardiovascular physiology questions. So I, I would encourage you to study autonomics with toxicology, with cardiovascular physiology. 
And this is how I've developed a lot of my resources. Guys, I want to integrate things for you. I think that you can have a systematic approach to use first aid in an integrative manner. A pharmacology tip that I'm going to give you is that from now until your exam and even beyond, anytime you see a pharmacological agent, quickly recall in your mind the mechanism of action. Every single agent that you just see in a question, in a reading, anywhere, just recall the mechanism of action because that then helps you build that synapse and build that long-term memory. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and send you my lecture via email on toxicology. I would encourage you to watch it today, tomorrow, very close to this session. And I also want to just thank you for spending this hour with me into your afternoon. I hope that this was really helpful and I would be more than happy to stay in touch with you. And if you want to check out any of my resources, my step one notes, my rapid review, my study schedule, please feel free to visit my website to also even just reach out and email me. I hope that this webinar was helpful and I'd love to hear your feedback.